Oh, gosh. Well, Monica, you're very, very sweet. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks to you and to uh, Jim uh, Griebel and, and to the museum for inviting me to come. Gosh, 11th time in 25 years. It's, it, it, I mean, for me, uh, th thank you very, very much. For, for me, a real pleasure always to come back to uh, San Diego. And today feels like San Diego. Y yesterday, uh, when I arrived, I thought, oh, Lord, the planes landed on the East Coast <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> or Chicago. Or worse still, we've gone back to London, which is where I originated uh, the, the, the journey. Uh, and I really, in, in all those years, I've never seen San Diego look like it did yesterday. That, that was an interesting education for me, but I'm delighted uh, today that it's, uh, it's nice. And as Monica says, it's the day after St. Valentine's Day, a Valentine's Day. It sounds like the sort of day when everybody should have a hangover. So I hope, um, you know, this will, will cheer you up. And, I, you know, it, it's lovely to talk about Spanish art, which, as I'll explain in a moment, is not my main area. But on the other hand, San Diego, one of the pleasures of San Diego is the sort of Spanish air which blows from Mexico here and is everywhere, even in the art of the, even in the architecture of your own museum, the wonderful entrance is such a piece of beautiful Spanish architecture. And that's one of the great gifts of Spain, um, you know, to, to, to the world, its architecture. I mean, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about what Spain took from other parts of Europe, mostly Italy, but also Flanders. Um, but uh, the gift of its architecture, which it's left all over, you know, not only, you know, Latin America and Mexico, but in important parts of Europe. Just think of the architecture of Sicily, the town of Noto, um, Lecce, you know, pure Spanish architecture. That's a wonderful gift, and you feel it here, and so it feels entirely appropriate. I've spoken on many subjects in this hall before, but it's now, now nice to, to talk about Spanish art. And Spanish art is really where my own uh, journey of art history began, because when I was at university, or uh, really, in my first year, I was uncertain whether I should be a medical student or go for the humanities. And I come from a medical family. My father was a doctor. My brother's a neurologist. My grandfather was a surgeon. Medicine was just sort of at the breakfast table every day. And I, you know, wondered about going, you know, falling in and, and becoming a doctor as well. But in the end, I decided to go for the humanities. But my first interest in art was the paintings and the, the imaginative world of Goya. And what interested me about Goya was that he had a long life. He lived at the age of 80, 82, 83, I think. But halfway through that life, at the age of 41, he got a viral fever related, I think, probably to syphilis. And it left him stone deaf, completely and utterly deaf. And it wasn't a kind of increasing hardness of, you know, difficulty of hearing as it was with Beethoven, with tinnitus and all that. It was just completely the nerves were dead. And so he spent more than half of his active painting and imaginative career, his career as an artist, completely isolated uh, by this terrible affliction. But such an important personality was him, and it was he, and this is a measure of his, his greatness as an individual, that the king at the time, King Charles III of Spain, set himself to learn how to speak a kind of sign language. Nowadays, sign language for deaf people is, 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 uh, is formalized, but then it was, you know, it was rather less formalized. But the king learned that, and that, I think that's a very clear indication of how how, what a marvelous personality Goya must have been and how important the king, the most important person in the realm, felt it was to be able to talk to his court painter. So that's where my, uh, my interest began. But then I went to live and to work in Italy and to work with a great Italian art historian called Federico Zeri, who had many connections with California because he was a friend of John Paul Getty's and he uh, helped uh, a lot with the building up of the collection that John Paul Getty was making. And my interest went into Italian art. So today, in this talk, I just wanted to talk about the overlap 
between uh, Italy and the Italian art and Spanish art, because all those great um, Spanish painters, El Greco, uh, Goya, Velasquez, they all traveled to Italy, spent an important time there, and it was, it was formative and changing in different ways for them all. And then having talked about that, I then just like to go and have a look, finally, at some of the artists that didn't travel to Italy and how different their art is. And that, in a way, is even more interesting because it shows us where the true Spanishness, the, the irreducible Spanishness of Spanish art lies. So that's our journey today. So let, let's begin with the first uh, image. If we can just have the lights down. I will give you an image. Does that uh, image mean anything to any of you in the audience? Do some people recognize it? Or is it sort of, is it, conf is it flummoxing you? How many are flummoxed? Okay, most, most people, but some recognize it? Okay, wonderful. <laughs> it's the work, actually, of a, of a contemporary Spanish artist called uh, Jose Manuel uh, Ballester. He's a photographer and painter. And what he does uh, often in his works is to take a very, very great painting, uh, one of the most famous, you know, the, the, of the, amongst the most famous that there are, and then simply remove all the people from it. And uh, if I show you the original painting of this, you, I mean, the, the one he's working on, then, of course, you'll all recognize it because <laughs> there we are. Yeah, not a person in the room doesn't know it. One of, it, Kenneth Clark called this one of the most genuinely revolutionary paintings ever produced. In other words, revolutionary in spirit, revolutionary in style, revolutionary in every in conception. I mean, a truly, truly revolutionary painting. Uh, and you can see what Ballester does uh, is actually, actually rather educative to us. Um, because he draws our attention, let me just go back to it, he draws our attention to the fact, it is wonderful, it's a very, I mean, it, it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, he draws our attention to the fact that the lighting, one of the strokes of genius of Goya is the, the creation of this cube of light which illuminates the painting because obviously these uh, assassinations, these uh, firing squad is happening at night. This is the 3rd of May, 1808, an invasion of Spain by Napoleonic troops uh, and the meeting out of summary uh, and unfair justice on local uh, people. Uh, and it, it's full of wonderful geometry. Uh, one doesn't think of Goya being a painter who thinks in geometrical terms, but look at this wonderful sort of wedge triangular shape there, which sort of invades this sort of line here, which comes out with the points there, and then the little cube of light, which lightens everything up, including this magnificent uh, figure with his arms uh, splayed. There are so many ways of reading this painting, and for that reason, it is one of the most famous paintings Goya produced, and one of the most famous paintings, not just of Spanish painting, but <clears throat> of European art in general. Um, but notice how um, he takes a common scene. Uh, terror, I mean, it was sadly very common in his time. Uh, in other words, n an anonymous scene. You know, we're, we're not talking about the killing of the Emperor Maximilian or anything like that, just a mass destruction of a number of undesirables there. And he turns it into a into a religious painting in a way, because I don't know whether you can see up there in the right hand of the figure, whose hands are out there, very, very clearly and quite deliberately and unmistakably, that's not just my reading into it, there is a great big hole of what we might call stigmata, or the hole you know, which reflects, of course, the place where the nails were put through the palm of the hand when uh, Jesus of Nazareth was uh, hung on the cross. So he in just did that tiny, tiny thing. He transforms this painting from being a, uh, a general painting to a, a, a devotional painting uh, also. So it's a wonderful thing. And this was something that um, 
I'm sure he'd learned um, looking at, I mean, this is not, a, don't look for specific sort of overlaps between these paintings, but from ideas. Goya felt things very deeply and, and, and saw things at a very, very deep and unconscious level. And when he traveled to Italy in 1770 and went to Rome, which he liked very much, uh, as you, I'll show you the evidence for that in just a moment. He saw paintings by Caravaggio, who was famous and rightly lauded also for and praised for making um, scenes contemporary and very, very real to the viewer. These the soldiers here uh, wearing contemporary armor of the 16th century. Uh, and notice also the lantern there. I'm not saying that Goya necessarily took that idea of the lantern in the uh, 3rd of May uh, painting, the 1808 painting, but it's curious that, uh, it's, it's very typical of Caravaggio, that he illuminated his paintings with a, with a central lantern like that in order to, uh, to show, uh, this is probably the figure of St. Peter holding that lantern up there. There's a nice connection anyway with the, uh, with the other. And then the geometry of this, with this line here reminds me of those those awful <coughs> guns that we saw in the last painting. And of course, as always, as often Goya does as well, he puts himself, the author puts himself in the painting, and this is believed generally to be this figure uh, holding up the lantern, <coughs> uh, a self-portrait uh, of <coughs> Caravaggio, whose life, as you know, I mean, Caravaggio could be the story of a, another whole series of lectures, and it doesn't belong here, but whose life was fascinating and deeply in, involved with his, uh, with his, with his painting. Um, Caravaggio has a genius unlike anyone else for this way of naturalizing and humanizing and contemporaneizing, if you like, uh, scenes from religious history. It's this overlap between the contemporary life that you and I live with what is also the religious, which we saw just in that tiny reference uh, with the hole in the hands of the figure being assassinated in the 3rd of May in the first slide. This one, this is a lovely painting in Rome. The, the last one was in the possession of the Mattei family. Um, this of the Doria family in, in Rome. Um, we don't have documentary evidence that Goya necessarily saw these paintings. Um, he sketched quite a number of paintings in his quaderno, his travel journal. Um, but he spent some time in Rome. He had good connections there. And Caravaggio was one of the things that, along with Michelangelo and Raphael, that people came to see when they went in the 18th century uh, to, to Rome. So it's very likely that he would have seen this painting, even though we can't be certain. What's wonderful about this, this is the Magdalene. It's often called the penitent Magdalene. There she is with her jar of ointment, which tells you, tells us who she is. Uh, the pearls and brooches and all the trappings of her life as a prostitute sort of cast aside. Um, but extraordinarily, she's fallen asleep. Now, though she's not being penitent like the penitent uh, Magdalene that you see, the wonderful one by Murillo up in the uh, galleries here at your own museum. And I, I sort of like to think that this was Caravaggio taking advantage of nature, coming into his own studio. Almost certainly, this was someone who was paying to be a model. She was a simple girl. He picked her up in the streets of Rome and said, OK, come and sit for me. You'll have to wear these clothes. So you can sit there and let me you know, begin to uh, work on the painting. And at some point, you know, she's been working all night, probably. Uh, she falls asleep. And 99 out of 100 painters would say, come on, wake up, wake up. I'm paying you to be a model. Sit there and look penitent. Don't fall asleep. The genius of Caravaggio is that he doesn't wake her up, but that he paints her fast asleep. And it's, it's that, that is that empathy for the person, for their you know, someone who's been working all night and has just simply fallen asleep. It's what makes this painting different from all other paintings by Mag the, of Mary Magdalene. And it's what characterizes the deep humanity 
uh, and novelty and originality uh, of uh, Caravaggio. In a way, I like to think that Goya saw this painting. He painted um, a Magdalene himself in 1810, I think this is. Um, not a well-known painting, but can I just do a little trick that, um, you know, PowerPoint allows one to do. It's terrible. We, wouldn't use, we didn't used to be able to do this in English. But if I flip it round, that um, it, it makes the point I, I want to make better than otherwise. Just look at the way the hair goes down, falls down there, falls down there. This, ex this unusual curve of the neck downwards there. Is it, a, you know... I never believe, really, that artists are deliberately copying one another. Sometimes they are, obviously, but that, that images that are particularly striking sink down and they're in a sort of hummus at the bottom of the imagination, and then later on they come up unexpectedly and without Goya even realizing, maybe, or maybe not. But anyway, these are the things that I think... I mean, I'll show you some examples of things that are, are much more directly connected to one another, but things that he understood almost like os by osmosis from his exposure to art uh, on his journey in Italy. There we are, just to remind you of Murillo's, the wonderful painting that you have upstairs, a really beautiful one. See how much more in the, in the style of proper classical art this is. I mean, this is a, a penitent Magdalene as she should be portrayed, looking wonderfully uh, so both beautiful and penitent, and you know, Murillo hasn't done what, what Caravaggio has, has done, which is have real empathy for the person who is you know, sitting there. Goya kept a little notebook all the time. <coughs> he was traveling, and he lists the places he visited in the left-hand column. This is from the Quaderno, as it's known, of 1770, 1771, the year of his journey to Italy. Um, places that he visited, but he says there, però las mejores son, but the best ones are Roma, Venezia, Bologna, Genova, etc. Right at the top of the list, the best one uh, is Rome. And what did he do in Rome? He, he did a, quite a lot of drawings, and in the same quaderno, the same uh, sketchbook, you find him copying in the Vatican one of the most famous pieces. This was a, a piece, he wasn't the first person to copy this. Just think how many times Michelangelo uh, reworked that torso there in the figures on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. All those, what are called ignudi on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's one of the, it's always been one of the famous pieces, go to pieces uh, to be seen in the public collection uh, of the Vatican, always visible to the public, ever since the 16th century, uh, the 4th century Greek uh, original, probably in Roman copy, uh, Greek originally, but in Roman copy here. And there is Goya's little sketch of it there. Um, and you see how the memory, as I say, sinks into this hummus. And many years later in his life, this is much later in his life, in the uh, 1820s. Um, so a good, almost half century after his journey, um, it re-emerges as this extraordinary, isolated colossus. And, you know, one of his most moving images, and it comes in various versions, sketches like this, but also in a finished painting. And, and this is what I was interested in, Goya, in originally, when I said that I, I was look, thinking of him as a medical student, I was interested in the deafness, and how the deafness affected his relations to the world. And deafness is, if I can just sort of parenthesize briefly on that, I mean, is a, is a, is a terrible isolator. It, it makes all kinds of borders that we take for, for granted um, ambiguous, to say the least. For example, when we sleep and we wake up, we know uh, we've woken up because there's noise. When we sleep, it's silent. But if you're deaf, that border between sleep and wakefulness is sort of eroded. And we begin to see dreams and the overlap of dreams and reality constantly in Goya's work. That's one kind of thing. Another thing is 
may be that, you know, when we hear somebody walk, uh, we know they walk because we hear the footfall. We actually feel it in our body. A deaf person doesn't. A nerve deaf person doesn't. And therefore, if you're in a room and a ghost goes in front of you and a person walks in front of you, the effect is the same to a, a deaf person. I mean, that's a slightly uh, facetious way of putting it, but this is why floating ghostly figures continually come back and back and back again in later Goya's paintings. And remember, you know, after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you've not heard a person to speak. You are very, very isolated. And this way of creating images against a blank background, which is the, the wonderful quality of Goya's portrait, seems to reflect that isolation which enveloped his life as a result of the medical, the, the clinical condition that he had. Um, so that was where my, my, my studies first began. But let's look at, enough on Goya for the moment, let's look at another painter who was in an entirely different way, very much uh, influenced by um, his uh, work, uh, visits to Rome, of which there were two, and often thought of as the greatest of all Spanish painters, namely Velasquez. The Pantheon in Rome. Cast your mind back to the year 1650, the 19th of March, 1650, in that building there, the Pantheon, still standing in the center of Rome, the uh, principal uh, painter's academy of Rome called the Academia di San Luca, dedicated to St. Luke, the sort of guild of painters, had their annual exhibition for admissions. In other words, admitting new painters to the guild. And one of the paintings exhibited in the Pantheon on the 19th of March in 1650, uh, by, in fact, in this case, a foreign artist, as a Spanish artist, Diego Velázquez, uh, was this painting here. You, you're very familiar with it. It's in the Metropolitan Museum in, in, in New York. Um, it's not just one of the greatest portraits Velázquez painted. It's one of the greatest portraits of all time. And, in fact, Palomino, uh, the biographer of Velázquez, um, says, uh, I haven't got a piece of paper out in time, but I'll paraphrase it for you. Um, he says, in the opinion of all the artists present, both foreign and Italian, all the other paintings seemed like art, whereas this one alone seemed like truth. Now, Palomino wasn't present there. In fact, he was still only a twinkle in his mother's eye at the time that in, 16, in March in 1650 uh, when that was exhibited. But he was obviously you know, working on, on things that had been related that people had said, and whatever, whether it was actually said or not, he's hit the nail absolutely on the head. What, what does he really mean? This one seemed like truth rather than art. Let me give you an example of a great portrait, much earlier actually, 1475 or so, by Antonello da Messina. Um, a wonderful portrait, absolutely recognizable as you know, who it may have been. But it's art, isn't it? I mean, you, you look at it and it's, it, it, it speaks artfulness to you. I mean, it's a wonderful, you, you, you're amazed at the technique of it, really. You know, the beautiful, and Antonello was in fact experimenting with a very new technique, a mixture of oil and pet tempera, which was very, very delicate and very difficult. It's a wonderful portrait, not in any way sort of less great than, than uh, Velasquez's, but it's art. We have no question about it. But when we go to, um, let's go back to Pareca there, to uh, his uh, mulatto slave, um, uh, it, it feels absolutely like truth, in a way, like life. Now, he's painting, as I say, his manservant, really somebody who was slaved, who, a slave, because he had no rights. He was of African, half-African origin, Pareja. He was a very, very uh, clever individual, uh, became a painter in his own right. And in the year in which Velázquez painted him, 1650, um, he actually arranged to release him from bondage 
to manumit him, to make him a, a citizen, a full right, a human being with full rights. Uh, and, you know, that seed is in his mind as he, you know, portrays this. You know, this is the 17th century. How do you portray someone who is your slave, technically, and someone who is of uh, a completely different uh, ethnic origin? I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful painting. Well, in that year, um, v uh, Velasquez was working on this great portrait of the Pope who'd just come to the, the throne. Uh, Innocent X, the Pamphili Pope, um, 1649, he was elected Pope. Um, and Velasquez was working on this at the time that he exhibited the portrait of his slave, uh, Pareja. And uh, you can see that the portrait also is a kind of warming up. It's a portrait, it's a preparation for this great formal portrait that he had to do. And this one too is one that, you know, <laughs> makes other papal portraits look like art. But this one is truth. His, his, in fact, those who saw the portrait before the Pope did were really worried that um, the Pope would not... Um, not find it flattering. I mean, this was an age in which portraits needed to be flattering. Uh, and there was a lot of concern that uh, it would not be, but it's in no way is a kind of parody. It's simply a very truthful picture of a rather suspicious individual. Uh, and Innocent was like that. He was a very conservative, very uh, suspicious man, uh, unlike his uh, predecessor, who had been painted by Titian. Uh, Paul III, who had died the previous year. We're very, very close here. This is 1548. Titian, Venetian painter, painting the previous pope. His name was Alessandro Farnese. who was the pope, uh, Paul III. And you can see that uh, Velasquez has it in mind, has it in mind as a sort of, you know, as a competitor, as something that he has to equal, and if possible, outdo. And the influence of Titian on uh, Velázquez, I think, is the single most important formative influence that the painter Velázquez has, because Titian taught him a lesson which Titian taught all of painting, which was that you don't need always to concentrate on your lines, on your drawing, on your draftsmanship. Uh, but that you can dissolve line in the interests of concentrating the eye on what's important, namely the face. Uh, in other words, we lose really what's in the definition. I mean, the photographers understand this. It's a question of focus and definition, soft focus, hard focus, and to alter the focus within a painting and to, to lose definition at the periphery. And this was Titian's great gift to painting because... Um, Few painters, had done, well, really only one who I'm coming to in a moment, had done that before him. Draftsmanship was fundamental for painting from ancient times right through the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. And one of the great uh, revolutions, I mean, really one of the great revolutions of the history of art was Titian's showing the way with this new medium of oil painting of eroding uh, definition in painting. And this is something that uh, uh, Velasquez has understood here. If we go close and look at the, uh, um, the lace collar that he's working, it simply disappears into a, if you get close enough, it simply disappears into a mass of different brush strokes. There's no definition there. It's wonderfully evoked. This painting has a power to suggest, but not to define. And that's something that, uh, Clearly, uh, Vel Velasquez learned as he came to Italy on his first visit, um, and I think uh, 1628, 29, 1629, uh, when he went to Venice and saw the paintings of Titian and Tintoretto. The painter, it's, we cannot say that Titian learned it from Giorgione, though I think. I think in a way he did, because the two are working so closely together in the studio uh, of a great Venetian painter, Giovanni Bellini, 
uh, that it, it, it's difficult to pick their works apart. It's difficult to pick their stylistic uh, development apart. But Giorgione, the author of this painting, which is the, you know, the jewel in the crown of your collection, and uh, well, I was in Venice just now. I was lecturing with a, a notable. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was just sort of, you know, the sort of entertainment. I mean, the, there were a number of good lecturers there as well. Um, uh, John Hope, who is a, a big ex uh, expert on, uh, on, on Venetian painting, says that he believes there are only really four paintings by Giorgione, of which we can be certain stylistically that they are by Giorgione, and he includes the Terry's portrait. Uh, as that. I mean, it is an extraordinary and wonderful painting. If it's not by George Ernie, then it's by somebody extraordinarily. <laughs> I mean, someone that we, we need to, to find out about seriously. But it, is, it, it has that quality that people observed in Velasquez. It, it, it doesn't just look like art. It looks like truth. Uh, and it's something to do with the way the eyes catches, just as the eyes catches with Juan de Pareja uh, by Velázquez. Big difference, 15, 9, 15, 10, 1650. You know, many, many years separate those paintings. But in Velázquez's mind, you know, what he's learned from Titian and Giorgione, in other words, the Venetian lesson of painting, um, has gone deep into him, and 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 the the two paintings are, are wonderfully. I mean, that's why I chose that as a as a as a sort of joint image for the for the flyer for this program because they seem to me to share this extraordinary quality, uh, or many many extraordinary qualities, um, of suggestiveness, of lack of definition, of of the soft focus which invites us to explore the personality, the, just the the psychological presence uh, of these two portraits. Absolutely wonderful. And as you see, the, the surface of the painting, when we get close to it, you know, where are the lines? You know, um, you know painting, painters' lives cross over a lot of the time. And when, um, when Michelangelo was in Rome, uh, you know, he was in Rome a lot of his life. He wanted to spend more time in Florence, but he's had to spend a lot of time in, uh, in, in Rome working for Paul III at the time. Titian was also there painting his portrait of Paul III. And Vasari, the biographer of the early Italian painting, said to uh, Michelangelo, they were very good friends, he said, let's go and call on Titian. Uh, I mean, you know, he's a great painter. Everybody talks about him. So let's go and, go and have a look. So they went round together, Vasari and Michelangelo went round together to Titian's studio. And there must have been an exchange of sort of glasses of wine and a lot of present, uh, pleasantries. Um, Titian was not a, I mean, not a person terribly, um, you know, proud of his work or whatever. And there must have been a lot of a kind of saying, well, you know, to, put him to Michelangelo, a lot of bowing and all that, and Michelangelo making sort of comments that were sort of vaguely praiseworthy of Titian. Anyway, the thing went off, and afterwards, Vasari said to Michelangelo, well, what did you think of Titian? He said, well, he's, you know, he's a good painter. It's just a pity he can't draw. <laughs> and, I mean, this is, this is the, the meeting of Florence and Rome. Michelangelo embodies everything about Florentine art, which is about draftsmanship, about accuracy, about perfect form, about geometry, about all these things. Florentine painting, as the history of painting before it, had been founded on draftsmanship. And Michelangelo felt that Titian, yes, he sort of knew how to use color and all that kind of thing, but he didn't know how to draw. And he would have said the same of this portrait if he'd seen it. George only doesn't know how to draw because where are the lines? They've gone. You know, it's all it's all sort of suggested rather than defined. And you see that in, in an early painting here in, in the uh, in the Louvre, the Fête Champêtre, the famous uh, work of, of sort of early sort of landscape, which is 
attributed, has been attributed to Titian, has been attributed to Georgia, and it is often attributed to both of them working together. It, it sort of encapsulates the whole problem of trying to distinguish their styles. But there we see what Michelangelo is talking about. But on the other hand, we see how Michelangelo missed the point completely. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting that a Venetian painting, after what Titian and Giorgione had taught painters, is the thing that uh, influences painting afterwards. Velasquez was, in, it was not at all influenced by Florentine painting, nor Goya, nor anyone else, nor El Greco. They were all influenced by uh, Venetian painting. So compare a Venetian fete, a champetre, a sort of country party, as it were, with something which you could call a country party by a Florentine painter, Sandro Botticelli, uh, in one of the great paintings of the world, and absolutely one of the most wonderful things to stand in front of. The Uffizi has removed its, redesigned its sort of, its, its rooms, and uh, the, this and the birth of Venus uh, stand together. It, it, I think it's one of the happiest experiences you can have uh, in art, is simply to stand in that room and marvel at this. It's a wonderful painting, but it's apples and oranges. This is all about draftsmanship. Everything is perfectly defined, whereas with Venetian painting, of course, it's, it's not. It's suggested, and there's a tonal unity and harmony, which we don't find in that. Well, um, Italian art came uh, into uh, Spain an awful lot. I mean, not only were it, uh, Spanish artists going to, to Italy, but Italian art came into Spain um, largely uh, through um, the collections uh, of Charles V and his son, Philip II. And uh, Titian became a favorite court uh, painter of Charles V, the most powerful man in Europe at the time, more powerful than the Pope. He and the Pope, well, Pope was a spiritual leader, but also an important temporal leader. Uh, Charles had sway over really most of Northern Europe, Spain, Portugal, uh, a huge area of land. He was one of the most powerful people that has ever sort of ruled uh, as, a, as a, a monarch in Europe. And here he is portrayed uh, by Titian. Uh, everything is reduced. All the definition of everything is gone except uh, the important face there. And his son, Philip II, was someone who uh, took this taste and art for, uh, taste for Italian art from his father uh, and began to collect it and bring um, Italian uh, painters and architects uh, to uh, Italy. Uh, rec we recognize his face, those rather sort of sensual lips, the arch of the brow there. This is said to be by Titian. It almost certainly is out of his workshop, and that almost certainly is where the master is working. Also, probably some details here. But then Titian was doing a million things at once, so he went off to pay another painting, and he said to the assistants, uh, okay, you do the right arm there. Well, I can tell you, you, you agree anyway. So, you know, the, um, and, and here he is. Here he is, Philip II. We can recognize uh, that if we, in fact, look, the same rather sensual lips with the, the mustache and the eyes with the brow over it as a very, very young man, um, you know, enjoying, enjoying the flavor and atmosphere of Venetian art. Um, but look at the definition that we have here, you know, the actual draftsmanship. You see what Michelangelo meant? Great painter, pity he couldn't draw. Well, that, what, would, what would Michelangelo have said of Velasquez, who absorbs this like, like, like a sponge? He looks at Titian, and Titian goes into his bloodstream. It really goes into his, not just the colors, but more importantly, this uh, sent, he takes it more, it's more than just soft focus. I mean, this wonderful detail from the marvelous portrait I'll show you the whole of, of a uh, little spaniel uh, there. I mean, just, just notice how somehow the spaniel is so, I mean, it, it's not art anymore, it's truth. As Palomino says, one has to keep coming back to what Palomino says, uh, and yet the lack of definition there in the uh, other elements. Well, this is this very very moving portrait. It's moving for many ways, not only because it's actually, I think probably Velasquez's last painting, he would be dead within about 11 months. 
so it's probably the last thing on his easel, or maybe uh, the portrait of his sister is, but anyway, we're, we're pretty much there at the end uh, of his life. And also the subject, Philip II's uh, young son and heir to the throne, Don Philip Prospero there. Um, you know, so much was invested in him. He was the male heir to the throne of, uh, of Spain. Yet you can probably see from these little amulets, little Cornelian horn there and bells and all these things that they are to ward off illness. He was epileptic. He was not well. There was a sickliness about him. And he died, um, I think, at the age of three and a half, not long after this uh, was portrayed. So the whole painting, though, though beautiful and unforgettable, is charged with a certain sadness. Uh, and there in his face, again, one sees, you know, what would Michelangelo say? That, you know, too bad for Michelangelo. Painting has moved on, Michelangelo. I'm sorry. No, you know, drawing is, you know, of course Velasquez knew how to draw, but drawing can be a, def uh, a distraction uh, in a portrait like that. But one looks at those eyes and the vulnerability of the uh, um, really comes through. When he died, Philip II, uh, uh, you know, one thinks of, uh, of the Spanish kings as more connected with the Inquisition than being tender hearted. But to, he said to his confessor, uh, Saw Maria, uh, he wrote a letter after Don Philip Prospero died. He said, The long illness of my son and my constant attendance at his bedside, you know, the king was at attendance at the bedside of his son, have prevented me from answering your letter, nor has my grief allowed me to do so until today. I confess to you, Saw Maria, that my grief is very great, as is natural after losing, losing such a jewel as this. I can assure you that what grieves me even more than my loss is that I clearly see that I've angered God and that these punishments are sent in retribution for my sins. Very Spanish indeed. Um, that's part of the world of the Inquisition, the Spanish Counter-Reformation uh, and so forth, for which uh, Philip II and his descendants, Philip III and Philip IV, uh, were very uh, much involved with. Uh, but in fact, five days after Don Philip Prospero uh, died, um, another son was born to his wife, Anne-Marie of, of Austria, who went on to become and to reign as Philip III. Philip II built the Escorial, an extraordinary building, um, with many, many works of art and, uh, uh, and uh, things of great beauty. And it, it's the work, uh, the architect uh, had spent all his time in Italy, Juan Battista Toledo had up until then been working on the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. So you see how dense the connections are between Italy and Spain. The whole building is an extraordinary expression of the soul of the state of, uh, of Spain. It's both a palace and a monastery equally in you know, two halves. It's like looking at a uh, it's like looking at an x-ray of the lungs, you know, the right lung and the left lung and the sort of, you know, this, speaking of the tube going up and there, you know, it, 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 one half is palace, one half is uh, a monastery. Um, that is the, the nature, that close uh, working together nature of the Spanish state. But in it were many, many important paintings by Titian, this one of the martyrdom of St. Lawrence. Uh, St. Lawrence is very important. He was the patron saint of the, the presiding saint of the family. And for that reason, actually, the palace is in the form of a barbecue gridiron. Um, that's, that's why it is that shape, because, of course, poor St. Lawrence, one of the early proto-martyrs of the Christian church, was grilled on a barbecue. Um, and that was his, the method of his uh, martyrdom. And interestingly, Velasquez in 1528 was asked to accompany sorry, in 1628, was asked to accompany Rubens, who was on a visit, to go and see the paintings of Titian in the palace. It's wonderful to think of these two great monumental painters, Rubens and Velasquez, standing in front of Titian, talking about it together. And one of the things that Rubens said to, to Velasquez is, I think you should go to Italy. I think it would be very, very good for you to go to Italy. And the next year, sure enough, he went. And then later on, Philip IV sent him uh, on a second journey, actually, to buy Italian art. Okay, we've talked about um, the, 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 the overlap of Italian and Spanish. Can I just now close with, mm, not quite yet, 
can I just close with five, ten minutes more? Are you okay? Are you comfortable? Or are you longing to go? <laughs> uh, just, if we can have the lights down again, just for a moment. Ah, oh, there we go, that's right. Wow, an entirely different world. Michelangelo would be happy here. There's real drawing. No fuzzy outlines at all. This is one of the very, very great paintings that was in the Escorial, the palace that you've just seen. Because the royal family of Spain collected not just Italian painting, but also great Flemish painting. <clears throat> and this is by Roger van der Weyden, 15th century a Flemish painter, and is a very, very, very moving work. I mean, it is astonishing. It's so boiled down, so clear. The focus is so perfect. There's no in, the color never gets in the way. It's simply a, a, a simple harmony of white, red, and green. And the figures have this sculptural quality to them. This is a silent world, contemplative world, completely different from the Italian. And it was being collected by the kings of Spain. Um, there's a partner painting to this. If you, if you go to Philadelphia in the Museum of Art, there, there's another crucifixion, the same reds and whites. It's absolutely wonderful. And the detail of it is, is a figuring of the face, which is completely different from, in, in manner and conception from the faces that you've been looking at of the young Philip Prosper or the little princeling uh, or the, paint, painter, the painting of... Um, Velasquez's servant, Pareja. Uh, this kind of Flemish art was available for native Spanish artists who didn't have the possibility of traveling to Rome uh, to see. And it imbues deeply, it forms a kind of complementary current. Uh, and I'm talking obviously here about uh, Zurbaran, uh, whose portrait of uh, Fray <coughs> Diego Deza here. Even the same colors, the red and the white, but the clear focus, the lack of any distraction of any sort. You're completely happy that the painting is, is completed. One never knows with Velasquez whether really he's finished it or not. It, it's still evolving and creating. Yeah, no, it's, it's finished. And even Michelangelo would be happy with that. And the crucifixion that you've just seen by Roger van der Weyden clearly has gone into Zorbaran and how the marvelous ceramic clear flesh here, even the pose. Um, it's a wonderful, I mean, it, th th this is the other side of, of, of Spanish painting. Uh, and this uh, painting in the, the Fine Arts Gallery in Seville of an obscure um, Miracle produced, uh, performed by an 11th century saint, St. Hughes here. Uh, but let's not go into the details of the theology of the miracle, but simply the way in which uh, the light is clear and focused, and it has this Flemish quality of utter stillness and utter precision, which is what was available and, and, and seemed to have appealed most uh, to the Spanish painters who didn't travel to Italy. And you see this uh, in Zurbaran's unearthly studies of, uh, of still life, this rose with a cup of water. Absolutely, I mean, you know, this kind of way of painting was being developed also, obviously, in the lowlands, in, 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 in the Netherlands and in Flanders, and, you know, in, in, in still lives there. And you have... It, in your own collection here, this wonderful silver. And I always feel about this painting, you know, there are 150 paintings there could be talking metaphorically about the sacrifice of Christ. You know, it, it's one of the commonest su the subjects of, of, of Christian art. And yet, this is the, the most succinct of them all. None speaks more powerfully than this one. It's an, it's an amazing painting. It's one of the other crowns in the jewel, jewels in the crown of, of, of the painting heaven. If you go to the Norton Simon, uh, you'll see Zorbrand's wonderful still night there. Where does this concentration, this distillation, this um, purity uh, come from? It's something 
we must always look to the landscape of countries. The landscape of Spain is something completely different from the landscape of, of Italy. It's much less populated. It's much less cultivated. It's much less, it, it, it's much less, there's much less feature in it. It has an emptiness. Anybody who's traveled in Spain, particularly in rural Spain, feels this sense of emptiness and silence. People aren't always in contact with one another as they are in a crowded country like Italy. Um, it, it, it's an extraordinary thing. And this, this open, this great open, silent, big landscape is something that speaks through uh, this kind of Spanish painting. Uh, you see it here. Uh, even today, I mean, even in modern painting, this is Dali. I mean, that Spanish landscape comes, comes through the emptiness, the openness. It could almost be that landscape. Um, and speaking of Dali, you know, I'm, I don't know whether that painting reminds you of something that you have in this gallery. Does it, does it sort of ring a bell? I mean, when I look at that, I always think of that, you know, there's something. <laughs> so um, all I want to say is that there are these two aspects, two counter, not counter currents, but complementary currents. There are the ones who, the, the artists who, 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 who responded deeply to what was Italian. Remember Rubens' advice to Velasquez, go to Italy. And there you'll learn, really, uh, how to paint. Uh, and then the artists who were working in Seville, like Jules Beran and uh, Sanchez Cotan, and, and, you know, that uh, didn't, but were really, really more uh, aware of what was uh, of Flemish. The lovely thing about Velasquez, of course, is that, in fact, he, in a way, combines both. He has that Titian soft focus, the lack of definition, uh, the tonal harmony there. But also, there is a kind of emptiness uh, which is very Spanish. You can look at the details like that and wonder how the, the brush strokes, how they, how, they, how, they, how they do it, how these brush strokes come together actually to, divine a per, to define a person as well as it is. Or you can do that. <laughs> and so we end where we began with Jose Manuel um, Ballestero, who here has taken Velasquez's Meninas the evening after everybody's left. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have been a little bit longer, but thank you for, for, uh, for listening. <clears throat> yes, of course, absolutely, yeah. A Can you hear? Yeah. You have to put the so that back was in. wonderful. You said uh, Giorgione is the jewel of our collection. You are the jewel of our speaker too. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. that's another Valentine's Day <laughs> hug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah. we do have uh, time for a few questions and answers. Uh, Carolyn and Lane will one on this side. Oh, this one. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Hands, hands, hands. A very short little two. question, uh, which uh, is out of the zone. Giotto. Yes. Where would you categorize him, north or southern, northern or southern Italian? Just out of curiosity. Well, <laughs> oh, well I mean, he's, he, he's quintessentially Florentine. I, I don't see the decision as uh, the differentiation differ, difference being north and south, but more being uh, Italy is a very thin country, but it's west and east, as it were. But, I mean, it, it, Giotto is a painter who sets Florentine art on its, on, it, on its track. It's interest in sculptural quality, which is what interested Michelangelo. You know, El Greco said about Mike, you know, Mike, we heard what Michelangelo said about uh, Titian. El Greco said in Rome about Michelangelo, the thing is he doesn't know how to paint. <laughs> and what he meant was that he doesn't you know how to use color. And actually, if Michelangelo had heard that, he'd have probably said, you're right, you're right. I, I never wanted to be a painter. I never was a painter. I'm a sculptor and an architect. He's a wonderful architect. So and I, I think the great thing about sort of Giotto is that he, his gift to his Florentine art is its concentration on the sculptural 3D solid 
quality, which, you know, is the great sort of wonderful thing about Florentine art. It's not, any, not a thing of Venetian art at all. They do something completely different. So he very much belongs in, in that camp. Uh, and the problem is for Florence that Michelangelo said about Flemish painting and about Venetian painting that he thought it was, he thought it was girly stuff. He thought it was easy. It was sort of not real true painting. Uh, true painting was about draftsmanship and solidity and sculptural qualities. And that put, the, put, the, put a full stop to Florentine art. It just it stopped with Michelangelo. Nothing much happens afterwards. Except Pontormo, and there's a wonderful Pontormo in, in uh, Los Angeles at the moment that's just been cleaned at the Getty. You should go and see it. But they're very, very different, so I put him in the Florentine. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Thank you. The, I got the point about the two different sources for Spanish art, the Flemish and the, the yeah. Florentine. What was, where did the Flemish art bloom from? I mean, it, uh, it is very distinctive. Did it have roots somewhere? Where did Flemish art itself come yes. from? Yeah, I think you need to look for several things. It's, it's, we're obviously in Northern Europe now. We're in the area of Belgium, Holland, Northern France. The early history of Northern Europe was much more turbulent than the, uh, the, the, the Mediterranean world. And portable art had great value. In other words, little miniatures, the miniature world of the illustrated manuscript, the, the book that you open and you see the colors beautifully preserved because they've been kept in the book. That kind of miniature work, because it was portable, was very important. I mean, a big altarpiece, you don't you know, it's difficult to move. Whereas if you're in, you know, to have portable art is very important. That's one thing. I think that miniature thing comes from in, in political instability because these monasteries were constantly under attack of one sort or another. And, and to be able to, 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 to move art and to, so the, 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 the miniatureness of it comes from that. The other thing is the tradition of stained glass. I think that's really important. Those translucent colors in Flemish art come from the fact, simple fact that um, stained glass is backlit, the light comes through the color, and that's what happens in Flemish painting. It's like a light is on inside the painting. And of course, stained glass comes from the climate. In the north, you have not much light in, for a lot of the year. And so in your church, you want to maximize the windows and minimize the walls. So you do all your decorative stuff in glass. In the south, in Italy, you've got too much light. In the summer, it's dazzling. So you minimize the windows. You have tiny little windows, and you have walls. And on the walls, you paint frescoes. So that's why we have frescoes in the south and stained glass in the north. But given that you've got this very strong tradition from the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries of stained glass and that lovely translucent color, I think the painters tried to imitate it. So that's where I would see you know, it coming, whereas the tradition in the south, the fresco painting, you know, has long roots in Roman art and you know, the, the frescoes that we know of in, in Pompeii. So a very interesting question indeed. Any more, any more questions? You don't have to ask any questions if you don't feel like it. <laughs> Are we both going to the same place? Picasso's line that uh, good artists copy and great artists steal, um, it, 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 it's kind of all around your talk, uh, but this uh, light in uh, Guernica and the light in Van Gogh's potato eaters looks very similar to me. What are the ethics of this, and uh, how does that... Uh, I mean, it's very different stealing an art, I suppose. So, so the, the, the light in Guernica and... Potato eaters. Uh, ah, the pot <laughs> Right, sort of, uh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm flummoxed by that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, if you, I'm, not, I'm not understanding the question completely. Are you asking where the light? When an artist steals, like yes. that, uh, 
what are the ethics of it? And what, what, uh, oh, how, how I see work? what you yeah. mean, yes. Yes. I mean, it, light is an expression of... It, it, people have said light is an expression of love in painting. I'm not sure if it's quite that. It's an expression of empathy. And I think the thing that people saw on the 19th of March, 1650, in that painting in the, you know, of, of, of Juan de Pereja, uh, was the sense of empathy that the, the painter had for the sitter, that Velasquez had for his... Uh, and so it's an expression of that. When light is absent, or, or is very, very... I, I, I mean, uh, is, the, is the light in the Guanica? I mean, it, it, it's... Oh, I see that, like the harsh light, yes. And that's in the potato eaters also. Ah, okay, that sort of kind of as if there's a light hanging over the sure. table, yeah. Are you, I mean, maybe you should answer your own question <laughs> on that. I, think. <laughs> I mean, t t t t tell us what so it does. What if he, so if he gets away with it and nobody notices, so uh, Picasso gets away with copying something and nobody notices it. Is it really stealing? Ah, I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not really answering that one very well. Sorry. sorry. Oh, right. I think uh, sort of maybe uh, sort of 40 love, I think, that one. <laughs> sorry, I love. Anyone else want to lob a ball <laughs> over the net? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Well, nobody wants to ask any more questions now. So ah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> yeah.